You're probably here because you're committed to having student-centered music classes or ensembles and are wondering how you can get started, or maybe you're already off to a good start and you want to help your program become even more learner-centered. Want a sneak peek of what might help us get there? By the end of this video, you'll know how this fantastic resource is going to help you support an even more student-centered music program. But this means being ready to be reflective about your own teaching and willing to possibly change some things. Are you ready? All right, let's get started. To help us analyze our programs and develop a plan for supporting a more student-centered program, we're going to work with professors Helen Cahill and Babak Dodvin's article and their P7 framework, or 7P framework. Now you might be thinking, I already know how student-centered my music program is, and I just need some strategies and best practices, and I hear you. But if we're really embracing the ethic of student-centeredness, it makes the most sense for you to develop an approach that is specific to the students in your program. Now I recommend you watch this entire video so you have a sense of the key frameworks and ideas and then go back when you have some time and pause after each framework or concept and reflect on your program in relation to the idea to help you determine which specific aspects of your program can adapt and what impact that might have on student centeredness. I also encourage you to read Cahill and Dodvin's article and to watch their own video explaining their framework. So let's work with some of these models and analyze our music programs and then develop some strategies. Models! As far as the eye can see! Okay, so this first model we'll look at is Hart's Ladder of Participation. When you look at Hart's Ladder, you can see on the bottom rungs you have non-participation, and on the top rungs you have degree of participation. So this is that hierarchy that, that Cahill and Dodman are talking about. Um, and on the bottom, manipulation, decoration, and tokenism. So if you were to look at your program, you would say, to what extent does youth involvement reflect manipulation, decoration, tokenism. But I think most people, when they look at Hart's Ladder of the folks in music learning and teaching and music education who I have encountered when we're talking about this, seem to start with this idea of assigned but informed, where teachers are saying, this is what you're going to do and I will let you know, and then start kind of starting at that point of the ladder and then are might be other rungs up so for instance consulted with you know what music do you want do you think you want to play um here's the kind of music that we want to play and then i think through it and then i make a decision so it's a consulted but the adult is making a decision and the students are informed of it whereas when we move further up there is you can see that the higher you move up on the ladder the more learner-centeredness there is and the more decision-making there is. So with Latin rung number six, we have a project or let's say a concert. There's repertoire, maybe a project that's adult-initiated, but there are shared decisions with students. And then it's at rung seven where whatever is happening in the music class or ensemble is student-initiated and directed. And I think for a lot of folks, they might be, be at rung six, but it takes a bit more to move towards rung seven, although maybe some people are there already. You're just using this to kind of gauge where you might be. Um, and then rung number eight, where ch it, everything is child-initiated or student-initiated and shared decisions with adults, where it is collaborative. So you might look at the, rung, the heart's ladder and ask yourself, where am I on this ladder? Where's my program on this ladder? And oh, what would it take to move up to this next rung? But I think to Cahill and Dodvin's point, that tends to be a more linear way of thinking about things. And so their model provides a little bit of a different way of thinking through participation. So that's Hart's Ladder. And um, I'll put a link to where, where you can find Hart's original ladder. And um, Hart did actually publish something reflecting on the ladder some years later that I'll try to find that for you as well. Okay, so here we have Tresseter 1997. You can see here, the organizing factor here are degrees of participation, and you'll see some similar language to Hart's Ladder. Assigned but informed, adult-initiated, shared decisions with children, child-initiated and directed, child-initiated, shared decisions with adults, and consulted and informed. Similar discourse, but you no longer have the hierarchy that you had with Hart's Ladder. Um, and so what you might be able to do with this model is think rather than is my program this degree of um, learner centered or this degree of learner centered centered or where is my program on the ladder, you can look across your program and say when is my program reflective of any of these degrees of participation or to what degree of participation might this aspect of my program have in relationship to youth voice and youth perspectives. So you can kind of take a look through this and then think through 
when we're planning a concert, where does that fit in this part of the model? When we are choosing what musical games to play, when we're choosing what the curriculum includes or doesn't include, when we're thinking through who's going to visit our program, any of these things can be kind of put into this model so that you can think through the degrees of participation in relationship to your music program. Moving on. Okay, moving on to Shire 2001. Um, this looks a little bit different, and here on the left-hand side, you can see levels of participation, where on the bottom, children are listened to, and then you move through the top, you have children share power and responsibility for decision-making. So here, swap out the word children for students and think through your program. Um, when I have shared this with students in the classes that I teach, I have found very different reactions. Some people have found it helpful to kind of go through this diagram and where it says start here and ask themselves these questions and kind of say like, hey, here's where I am. Other people's have had a visceral negative reaction to this. I'm sorry, I just don't buy it. So wherever you are on this, I encourage you just to kind of take a look through it and ask yourself these questions. Are you ready to listen to students? Okay, do you work with students in a way that enables you to listen to students? Is it a policy requirement that students might be listened to? Are you ready to let students join in your decision-making processes? And I'm on um, line number four here. Is there a procedure that enables students to join in decision-making processes? And again, if you think back to your programs and you might find there are certain parts of your programs where this is in place and there are certain parts of your programs where it's not and you can kind of gauge your program in relationship to what Shire calls openings, opportunities, and obligations. So as Kaho and Dodvin point out, some of the critiques towards this particular model are the way it is hierarchical and the way that it really does center adults. It's somewhat static and it's not as dynamic as the Cahill and Dodvin from my perspective and from their perspective, and we'll get to that model in just a moment. So, moving on. Here we have Wong, Zimmerman, and Parker, 2010, A Typology of Youth Participation and Empowerment Pyramid. And as you look here, you'll see that this is really focused on the idea of control and empowerment and the degree to which youth or adults are having voice and are in control. So if you look all the way on the left-hand side, you'll see lack of youth voice and participation and adults have total control. On the right-hand side, youth have voice and active participant role and youth have total control. And then you have different degrees of youth and adult control. Control, control. And so you could look at your music program and ask yourself, where are the instances where, let's say, students have some voice, but they might not have control? Where are some instances where they have both voice and control? And where are some instances where they don't have voice or control? You've made all the decisions. You um, have not asked them for their perspectives. And there is not a place for them to sort of enter into that conversation. What you might do with this is figure out what could you do to provide more voice and more control and where are the moments where that makes sense in your programs. Now we have some ideas. It's probably not as helpful to focus on the labels themselves and say, I have a program where I'm at the symbolic level of empowerment and control or in my program it's very pluralistic. Really think here and try to take this diagram or model and think of it more dynamically, which again, the Cahill and Dodvin 7P model does a really nice job of doing that. But moving on. And that takes us to the P7 model or 7P model by Cahill and Dodvin. The rest of this video, we're gonna kind of work through each of the parts of this model and what that means for our music programs. The reason why I find this model helpful and why I think it's worth spending some time with it is because it is dynamic and that it shows how each of the parts relate to one another and that it takes place and process and purpose into consideration. For those of you that are willing, work with this model with the students in your program to get their perspectives as well. Attention students! So when you think about power relations, you have a particular perspective on how those play out in your program and students might have a different perspective or perhaps it aligns with you. So let's do this. This model consists of the interaction of purpose, positioning, perspectives, power relations, protection, place, and process. Now say that seven times fast. But the point here is that each of these P's plays an important role in developing our program so that they could be more learner-centered. 
So we're going to apply this model to music programs, and I encourage you to spend more time getting into the specifics of your program in relationship to each of these parts of the model. When you look at the P7 model, the importance of purpose is visible. It's large, it's in the middle of the model, and it highlights how the purpose of a program interacts with all other parts of the model. So think for a moment about a class or ensemble that you teach. What is the purpose of that class or ensemble? Now if you have an immediate answer that seems obvious, I encourage you to think a bit more and dig a bit deeper. If we look at it from a deeper view in more dimension, The purpose of the program should inform its design, and we can include young people as co-creators in collectively generating or reshaping a sense of purpose. Cahal and Davin make the point that a sense of purpose can be strongest when collectively generated and shared with young people themselves. The purpose of an ensemble or music class is often taken for granted and informed by decades of tradition. How often do you discuss the purpose of your programs with students, and to what extent do you invite students to determine the purpose of the ensemble or class with you? Ask your students the next time you see them, from your perspective, what is the purpose of this class or ensemble? What is the purpose of Then consider asking them, from your perspective, what should the purpose of this class or ensemble be? Of course, that's the purpose. And you might find out things that you didn't know ahead of time. Thinking about the purpose of a music class or ensemble is important because the purpose, whether you've mentioned that out loud or not, has a huge impact on what is valued and what is supported or sometimes marginalized in a program. Cahill and Dodvin explain that when we think through the purpose of a program, we can consider what the program aims to achieve, and we can identify potential opportunities for young people to play an active role in shaping or evolving program objectives. Consider the impact that a particular purpose has on the ways that students might engage in a music class or ensemble and what they might contribute. There's a difference between a class where students contribute to the decisions made about what music they play and how they perform it, and a class where students are excluded from such decisions. There's also a difference between students contributing excellent tone, accurate pitches and rhythms, and expressive phrasing, and students contributing their perspectives and plans on how they might make a positive impact on their community through music. In other words, when we default to a specific purpose of an ensemble or music class, we may limit what students can contribute both in terms of the purpose of that ensemble or class and what they contribute to that ensemble or class in relation to its purpose. Towards the end of this video, we'll figure out what we can do about this, but right now, let's consider another part of the P7 or 7P model. Over here on the P7 model, we have positioning, which encourages us to consider how young people will get to contribute. Think of one of your music classes or ensembles and consider how do students contribute. Learner-centeredness means being intentional about students making decisions regarding what they do and learn in our classes and ensembles. Cahill and Dodvin explain that the concept of positioning helps us think through how young people are culturally framed and understood in terms of what is possible or desirable in terms of their contributions. There's a chance that we sometimes underestimate what students bring to the table in terms of their ideas, suggestions, and perspectives and the role they can play in decision making. I think it's also helpful to consider if students are contributing to decisions in the music class or ensemble, when those decisions occur in relation to the curriculum. For instance, students might choose among activities on a choice board, which is a different type of contribution or decision than those involved when students design a project that they might work on for several weeks, including the goal of that project and what it might entail. As Cahill and Dodvin argue, positioning factors in how young people develop a sense of agency and empowerment in relation to the larger social world. Cahill and Dodvin further make the point that by thinking through positioning, we might pay attention to the ways in which traditions can limit imaginations for what is possible in relation to children's and young people's participation. Let's think about this for a moment. And what traditions do you speak of? What are the traditions of the ensembles or music classes that you teach? Now consider, how are students in your ensemble or music classes positioned in terms of how they participate in and contribute to these music classes and ensembles? If the traditions we continue limit how students participate and contribute, we might consider imagining possibilities of other ways to design and facilitate our music classes and ensembles that support a broader spectrum of youth participation and decision making. Well, how else would I do it? With that in mind, let's move on to another part of the P7 model. The perspectives of who we include and exclude in our music classes and ensembles are critical for us to consider if we are to increase the learner-centeredness of our music programs. I would consider all perspectives. 
If our program fosters a unified perspective among students, we might consider if we are doing things that filter out other people and perspectives, whether intentionally or unintentionally. How are we taking into account the differences and diversities that exist among young people? I know you each have a different perspective. So, in your music classes and ensembles, during a rehearsal, whose perspectives are voiced? In a music class, whose perspectives inform what students learn and how they engage musically? Even the structures we create to include student perspectives could be explored in terms of the idea of who can say what, when, and how. For instance, consider how structures such as student representative councils, section leaders, first chairs having drum majors, impact who can say what, when, and how. Also consider which students across your school are represented in the music program. Hey, wait a minute. Who's missing? And why some segments of the student body might not participate in the program. Why might this be the case? Might other types of music classes and ensembles be of interest to these students? How might these students and their perspectives contribute to the music program? To correlate the possible contributions. As Cahill and Dodvin suggest, we ought to work to reach, recruit, and learn from the perspectives of those who might otherwise remain marginalized. Student-centered music programs need and support varied perspectives. So if these perspectives are not currently in your program, Get some perspective! and you want a more learner-centered program, it might take going out and finding additional students who might be in your program, and that might mean We may need to make some tweaks. Changing aspects of your program. What does power have to do with student-centered music programs? Who among you has the power? Cahill and Dodvin encourage us to think about how we build inclusion and respect in our programs. We can think of this in terms of who is or is not involved, but also whose voices are or are not heard and listened to in our classes and ensembles, and maybe even what types of perspectives are or are not addressed. This includes control and decision making. We were thinking earlier about roles such as student council, section leaders, first chairs, drum majors. How might these roles and structures relate to power and who does or does not have their voices heard in your program? Hello? Do you hear me? Cahill and Dodvin remind us that power is relational. So think about how does power flow between you and students in your program? How does power flow between students in your program? For instance, during a rehearsal, who speaks? Who shares perspectives on what changes should be made? Which suggestions are implemented? Working for student-centeredness means being aware if some students have insider access or knowledge that others don't have, and being aware of how we might acknowledge and honor some ways of knowing and doing music, but exclude or marginalize other ways of knowing and doing music. Moving ahead, we should reflect on who has power and the degree to which it is distributed among all people in the program. So to increase the student-centeredness of your program, consider these questions about power relations. How are roles and responsibilities assigned, adopted, and enacted in your program? How are relationships managed to ensure equity and respect is enacted between all parties? So one of the ways that you can work toward a more student-centered program is thinking through how power works and how power flows throughout your program, and then potentially redistributing the power and working with students to figure out what that means. Once you have a sense of who participates, how students participate, what their contributions include in your program, and how power is distributed throughout the music program, you can start thinking about how these aspects of your program impact how students can and cannot engage, along with the risks that students might encounter when participating. How clear and transparent are you about what is and is not acceptable in your program? Protection in this context refers to how you are ensuring the safety of students in the program. Cahill and Dodvin suggest that we develop ground rules for engagement. What are the ground rules and shared values for how you and students engage as a community in your program, and to what extent have you figured that out together with students? The what? The ground rules. One of the things I often do with students in the classes I teach at ASU is right at the very beginning of the semester, before we even look at the syllabus or start into working on major concepts of the class, is we develop a shared sense of how we want the class to be and how we might engage with each other. We sometimes refer to these as shared agreements or community agreements. We're all in agreement. So you might have a sense that you have a good community in your program, but to what extent did the students help develop that? And what role did they play in figuring out how they're going to engage with one another? Each of these components of the P7 model exists in relation to the context of place and process. 
How does the place of your state, community, school, program, room impact how students participate in the program? Consider how virtual spaces and place impact engagement and participation, and how does this change when students are in the same class virtually and physically? What does the place of your ensemble or type of class and all the socio-cultural and historical context of the ensemble or class impact students' participation? Again, we're looking beyond whether or not students participate to consider how, when, or why they participate, as well as what they contribute. While some of these issues are beyond your control, there are plenty of aspects of place, ranging from the ways we welcome and support students to the ways we engage with our communities that we can address. Let's talk process. Along with place, we need to consider the processes we employ in our music classes and ensembles. Running an efficient rehearsal and telling students how to adjust their performance is a different process than having students collaborate to crowdsource feedback on how they perform during a rehearsal and what they might do to improve. Similarly, having a small group of students make decisions about the program is a different process from facilitating dialogue across classes and ensembles. Working towards student-centeredness means being intentional about the approaches we use to support participation and engagement in our programs. The 7P model provides ways of thinking about what aspects of our program we can adjust to support learner-centeredness. The other models we learned about earlier can also help you gauge the degree to which your program is student-centered and to consider what you might do to make your program even more student-centered than it is currently. I really encourage you to work with the 7P model because of the way that it's dynamic and shows interaction between each of the seven Ps to help you and students think through the kinds of choices that you might make and actions you might take to make your program more learner-centered. The title of this video is First Steps for Supporting a Student-Centered Music Program, and applying these models and frameworks to reflect on and better understand what is happening is taking a first step towards more student-centered music classes and ensembles. By becoming more aware of how the seven pleas, please, the seven Ps play out in our ensembles and classes, we can make informed decisions about how we and students in our music programs might want to enact change. Make a choice, make a change. So if you are serious about learner-centeredness, take this first step and analyze your classes and ensembles in relation to the 7P model and the other frameworks in the Cahill and Dodman article. Gauge how student-centered your program is and in what ways students are included in decision-making. Speak with students in your program about what you and they are thinking in terms of learner-centeredness in the program. Then decide what aspect of the P7 model you can work on as an initial move forward to make your program more learner-centered. Taking this first step of analysis, reflection, and planning is a step forward in making a difference to the students in your program. Let us know what you realize about your program after engaging in the analysis and reflection outlined in this video. We can all support one another in working towards student-centeredness. You can also sign up for my newsletter in the link in the description below. Keep imagining possibilities for music learning and teaching and working to make those possibilities a reality. And I'll see you next time. Hey everyone, I'm Evan Tobias. I'm on the music learning and teaching faculty at Arizona State University, and I support music educators of all kinds. Imagine possibilities for music learning and teaching and then make those possibilities a reality.